it's pretty hard to follow George Schultz. But if I was going to think of two uh, people on the Stanford faculty who could, who could uh, stand up to that task, it would be Myron and Bob. So you know, guys. <laughs> so with that introduction, um, I'm going to just, you know, my hope for this panel was as academics, there's, I think there's a lot that is taken for granted in the discussion on Europe that I'm not quite sure why it's taken for granted. And so my hope here is to, to try to talk about some of the stuff that people take for granted. And I'm pretty certain with, that with these two men, um, they're going to be able, that, that they're going to do that. But to just start the discussion off, let me put up one slide, okay? And the slide that I want to put up is, um, those, are, those are sovereign bond yields, okay? Um, and the question I have for the panel to just start this discussion off, we have, so we have sovereign bond yields, the various countries at the bottom, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, France, Germany, okay? And everybody has different yields before the euro is introduced. Then we have this period where they all have exactly the same yields. And then the crisis hits and, they have, and they're back to having different yields. And I think some of the discussion today, I mean, I was going to ask the question, what happened in the middle there? How, how can we explain the stuff in the middle? But I, I, I think maybe the correct question is, what do we want, the middle or the end? I mean, a lot of people during the discussion today seem to think we want the middle. And I don't understand how we could ever have the middle. And so I think that's the first question to, to both of you, to tr try to explain to me what, you know, what, what do we want and, and, and how, do, how can you explain that middle to me? And I can see, Bob, you can go start that off. Well, I'm, I'm sure we're going to say the same thing, so the, I'll yeah. start. Um, okay, so, so the story of the picture, I think, is pretty simple. And I remember in the early 90s when, uh, when the prospect of the euro and the uh, Treaty of Maastricht was brought, gradually brought the euro into being, being um, the Italians in particular, who I think are probably one of the highest, I haven't checked there, but uh, uh, they, were, they felt very burdened by having to pay uh, much higher interest rates than, than the uh, Germans. And they said, well, it's all because uh, of our reputation for inflation and the Germans' uh, reputation for uh, price stability. So they saw it entirely as an as a expected depreciation of the lira issue. And they said, well, that's easy to deal with. Um, uh, you know, we, let's, let's have a common currency. And so the Italians and the other Southern Europeans were pushed very hard uh, to get into the euro. Uh, and, that, and sure enough, it worked, because I think their analysis was probably correct, uh, that it wasn't thought that uh, default risk was a big issue uh, in, in, say, in Italy and Spain, um, but rather uh, their reputation for being inflationary. Uh, then, uh, so, so there's a different cause for the, uh, the premium that emerged later when uh, uh, default became a very real possibility. Uh, the thing that nobody had anticipated was that the, the fundamental instability of of uh, democratic government, uh, which at least in theory, which the median voter theory, uh, theorem tells us, uh, is that the median voter who is way down the income distribution uh, ought to vote in favor of doing things that are differentially favorable to that group uh, by, you, in, we used to think of it as by taking from the rich. But it's actually came out in a very different way and it's every democracy practically now outside uh, the northern fringe of Europe but especially uh, state and federal, federal government in the US is doing that in a different way, and that is the median voter is voting for things that are very differential to this generation at extreme expense to future generations. So the median voter theorem is right. It just is working differently than, than what we thought. Uh, and that, of course, raises the possibility of default. Um, and uh, I think we're going to see a lot of defaults as a result of the utter and complete unwillingness of taxpayers to either part with uh, generous uh, uh, government programs or to pay for them. Uh, and in the U.S., of course, as in Southern Europe until quite recently, it was very strongly encouraged by low world interest rates, uh, which make the pain of, of entering into the debt currently very small, but still it's going to bear very heavily in the future. And sometime in the future, as has begun to happen, uh, say, in California uh, and, uh, and certainly in, in Greece um, and elsewhere, uh, 
of people just not being willing to pay the bills and defaulting, and of course that generates these default premiums. <clears throat> right. I, I mean, one does not know which is correct. Okay. If there was a really a fiscal union where they had common transfers that would have occurred among all the countries, so that you could pay off on the Spanish or Greek debts, obviously. There was uh, that as a possibility during the flat period, as you said, and now that has broken apart. So the question uh, becomes of the, uh, in uh, generally credit, or the, as Bob alluded to, talked about, was that there's sort of three fallacies of credit. And the fallacies of credit are there in Europe now, and they were there in Europe in the, in the turn of the 1900s. They were there in the 1920s and 30s in other countries as well. And the three fallacies of credit are essentially that if a country <coughs> has uh, borrowed money from another country and now they have trouble paying off their debts, that even though the, the option is way, way out of the money, that they'll ever be able to pay off their debts, that they, what you want to do is to keep lending that country money, so Germany lending money to uh, Spain or Italy or Greece or other countries that are joining in to do such such that they have a chance to grow, to get back, to have their economy strong enough so they can pay off on their old debts as well as the new debt that you lent them. And what I think is going to have to happen in the future, which is why spreads are increasing, is that that fallacy of the way out of the money option through growth in the economy will not be there. So they're going to be, have to be restructurings and, and the markets are realizing that that's the case. The second fallacy of credit is that if you have entitlements, or say to your population, you're going to have entitlements as Europe did uh, subsequent to the Second World War, and such as um, having a, a program that from cradle to grave, you have job security, not having a situation where you have uh, labor prices adjusting, that these entitlements is even given to the society and have never been funded, right? In other words, they're just going to be funded sometime in the future that even though the entitlements were not funded, those who were given the entitlements think that they've paid for them at their earned. And so as a result of that, it's very difficult to get rid of that uh, without having sort of defaults on debt and debt restructurings. And the third fallacy of credit is the idea that if you can export, uh, as Germany wants to export to the rest of the periphery, and the periphery uh, you lend the periphery credit or money to buy your goods and services, then by increasing your exports, you're better off, even though those you're lending money to will not be able to pay you off. And so basically, you, you know, it's one thing to give credit to someone to, to buy your goods and services. It's another thing to get paid off. And that's the idea that if um, Europe or Germany has prospered dramatically by exporting to the periphery, but that's been true, but it's been true because Germany has been willing, or the, Germany is willing to lend to the periphery, and now the question is, uh, will they be able to pay off? So my thinking is, for this to work, it's going to be necessitate, because the debts have built up so dramatically that basically you're going to need to have restructuring, and as a result of needing restructuring, uh, the markets are realizing that, and the spreads should be out accordingly. So the question to answer it is. Yeah, if everything's self-contained, they're homogeneous society with free movement of labor and capital, same uh, goods and services are provided, then fine. But if they're different and distinct and they have different transfers and uh, the like, it's not going to be the same. Okay, so why, I mean, I guess another theme of today has been this idea that default is a, is a, is a terrible, terrible thing. Do you agree with that? Well, I mean, I... I no, I mean that's happened in the past. If you look at defaults, that people, have, uh, countries have defaulted and continue to default, and, and or there's been different forms of default. Whether there's been huge amounts of inflation, where basically the debt holders have not uh, received in uh, in uh, purchasing power what they were promised initially, so there's been uh, default. In fact, most of the restructurings that have occurred in time have never really worked with with austerity or with transfers or, or the like, it's been mostly through currency depreciation or through inflation. And, and that's how uh, it seemed, that had seemed to be an easier route than having uh, the gold standard route, which means the gold standard where you had to have uh, wages falling and rental rates falling it takes a long time. 
uh, for that to occur relative to the inflationary rate. Is it the default uh, in the in the European setting uh, is likely to arise almost entirely from disappointed expectations of bailouts. Uh, you know, governments have done things that they would never have done, and banks as well, uh, things that they would never have done if they didn't think uh, that the government was uh, behind them. Um, one of the speakers earlier today uh, made it sound like it was essential for uh, there to be a government behind a bank. But that's exactly wrong. There shouldn't be a government behind a bank. There should be shareholders behind a bank who have sufficient equity so that the bank will never default. Um, but of course, we know that if the government offers a free put, uh, as governments, especially in Europe, but also in the U.S., have have done, then then uh, and then if they uh, if they don't actually uh, uh, honor the put, as in the case of Lehman, uh, then you get chaos. Uh, and that, that's potentially where uh, Europe is headed. The, the European Union w was modeled initially in a way similar to the US. The big difference is that it didn't contemplate having a very powerful central government that actually uh, collected a lot of tax and then used it for defense and that sort of thing. The, the, as George emphasized, the, the Europeans are pretty much uh, punted on defense. Uh, so they, they were just... Uh, just having a government uh, that supervises uh, uh, smaller units, in particular, though, uh, had a central bank, the ECB. So the analogy then is that the member states uh, of, the, of the EU and the, and the Euro uh, bloc are, uh, are like states. But there's a big difference because uh, it's taken for granted now, and certainly that's Draghi's view at the ECB, that uh, the ECB has to, has to bail out uh, by buying the debt of, of the, uh, of the uh, member countries of the EU. Whereas that's not what happens in the US. California, which is certainly headed for default, um, uh, it, would be, it would just cause uh, laughter in Washington if the state of California applied for a bailout from the federal government. I mean, that would just be an incredible joke. Such a joke is that the state would never even think of doing it. There's no expectation that California will be bailed out. Furthermore, in, in the, you go one layer down in the European Union, you see the same problem. The provinces of at least the southern European countries, and I think also to some extent Germany, are, live in a completely bailout world. So, uh, and they get bailed out. And in fact, they can just write checks, as the Spanish government has found. Uh, a number of the provinces of Spain have simply uh, written what amount of checks on the, on the central government is just set to pay it. Well, of course, uh, that generates a just completely irresponsible fiscal policy and occasionally will generate a default. Um, so what Europe, can I just finish one thing? What, what, what Europe needs to do, uh, which was almost impossible, this is what economists like to say, is it needs to have a one-time resolution in which uh, all the units that are hopelessly burdened with debt, uh, irresponsibly run up debt, uh, should be relieved of that debt uh, by, by a partial default, uh, a, a resolution. Um, and furthermore, that resolution should consider all the follow-on effects. For example, when the sovereigns default, uh, that's going to cause a large amount of bank default, and that has to be factored in. So thanks to the magic of matrix inversion, we can figure out once and for all uh, how to write down all the debt uh, and come out even without there being anybody saying, oh no, I'm being pushed under because uh, I thought my claim was good, but you guys wrote it down because your claim would be written down too, thanks to the magic of matrix inversion. Uh, and then from then on, we'd have the American and not the European uh, regime, which is that every, every national government and every provincial government and every city government stands on its own. You know, like the state of California did not bail out uh, Vallejo uh, or San Bernardino. Uh, they defaulted. They, they got the relief. So uh, that's the healthy way to run a, a fiscal system. And, and the whole mentality that every time a bank is in trouble, it needs to be, quote, recapitalized by the government, it's crazy. If, the, if it doesn't need to be recapitalized, it just needs to be defaulted. Uh, and, uh, you know, economists have been just saying this over and over and over, but the Europeans especially don't believe 
than any bank resolution and any national resolution either except paying things off, with a limited exception so far of Greek sovereign debts. But apart from that, like the Spanish banks are being good, about to be recapitalized with, with a huge amount of money uh, when in fact they should, their debt should be written off, which of course then we'd have to take care of all the follow-on effects. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to amplify, I agree with that. I was just going to amplify that in some sense we keep talking in the meetings here is the ECB is a separate institution, right. but it isn't. No. You know, it has a huge balance sheet now, and if the ECB is, could be broke as well, because the, basically if it goes broke, then it's Germany and uh, based on its GDP and others in the Eurozone as a, based on their GDP that has to recapitalize the central bank. Uh, yeah, although actually, but no, that's the same thing as them buying, there's only one finished thing, mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm, sure. them buying sort of California bonds and other bonds as well in the system. But the interesting point is that if other countries are asked to pony up money to recapitalize the ECB, it's going to be Germany. So what we're having in Europe now is actually, a rep, is actually taxation without representation because basically the ECB through the LTR programs, the ELA programs, through all, all the other Target 2 programs, already has such a huge liability that in uh, some sense, even the target too is Germany has owed by the other periphery countries through the ECB something like 850 billion euros. It's over a trillion now. It's over a trillion. It's over a trillion. Right. So, but that's without any German citizens voting whether they wanted to uh, provide these uh, resources. So the interesting issue is unless you had a fiscal union where you're one country and you're willing to tolerate transfers, then Basically, uh, you know, the system is really being funded right now by Germany through the fact that they have these, uh, the ECB has this huge uh, assets on their balance sheet. So you could get, you could have defaults, which would cause German citizens actually to have to uh, pay a large amount of money at this time. Deprive them of yeah, claims right. they thought were not correct. correct their target. Well, they didn't know they had their German citizens. But they didn't vote on. A footnote on this, if I may. Sure. Yeah. Uh, people talk about the ECB as if it were a financial institution, but it's actually not. It's just a coordinating organization. It, it coordinates something called the Euro system, which is actually just the national banks. So you'd, you really need to re-express that in terms of the Bundesbank is sitting on all kinds of claims through Target 2 and otherwise, uh, and, and they would say the National Bank of, uh, the Central Bank of Spain uh, uh, has very large obligations, which it's not gonna be able to pay off. When, they, when the ECB is resolved, presumably through the kind of uh, defaults that I've been talking about, there's going to be a tremendous hit to, to the Bundesbank and therefore to the taxpayers of Germany. And there's very little, very few people talk about that. Usually, usually you get this kind of a blank stare if you say target two. And then, but there's, it turns out there's two kinds of people. There's who, those who don't know about target two, and that's one group. And then there's the other group that knows too much about target two and doesn't want to say anything about it. So, <laughs> So, okay, right. another, another theme that I Correct. noticed is, I mean, I'm not a macroeconomist, so maybe, I'm talk maybe I don't really understand this, but it seems to me there's this contradiction on, on, the, on the following two ideas. One is, you know, it's a real pity that there's only one, there's one currency, because if there was separate currencies, then Greece could just devalue immediately and essentially take the pain all at once, right? And that's somehow a good thing. But on the same time, when we talk about banks, we say, Oh, no, 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 we can't let the bank default because that will be taking the pain all at once. Right, but if you look at history in terms of restructurings of a country, so, okay, we look over time, I think that it has been uh, inflation or currency devaluations have been the key way in which uh, that the economy has... But it's has very painful. It happens right now in one so, go versus okay, the question, a few years for this too. Right, but you can have, I sort of have it sort of like the X square rule of uh, finance or volatility. You can have volatility in your economy um, uh, of a certain amount each period. So you can try to smooth, or you can try to smooth things over. So the question is if you smooth them over, okay, so it looks very smooth and then it all blows up at one time in the future, is that worse than having a lot of volatility along the way? So if you, like we always put out fires in Yosemite National Park, you know, so that we put out all the small fires, but all the underbrush grew and grew and grew, and then lightning struck various parts of the park and the whole park burned down, so virtually. And now we have, the uh, same thing is true all over the United States in terms of fires, because we never let the fires go. So the question is, is it 
is it the case that if you should have a certain amount of volatility and you try to smooth it over, as you're saying, to dampen it down, that the consequence of that is that you could end up with a very large effect later down the road, which is of greater magnitude. Because if you should have two each period, for five periods, it's two squared is, is four times five is 20. But if you have zero, 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 and you have it in the fifth period, it's 100. Or 10 times 10 is 100. So the question is, can the policies of the government, and by letting the markets work and fluctuate as they might and adjust, um, are they themselves uh, able to have you have less effect by that activity? And probably the answer is no. I, I think I, I, I agree with your puzzlement. I, I would, I'm not sure I have much to add to it. I, I already explained that. I think this notion that uh, that everything would be fine in Greece if they just uh, uh, substituted a drachma whose purchasing power would, yeah, would world purchasing power would immediately drop. Uh, uh, it's not obvious at all that that uh, that's going to solve the social problems. I mean, I think that would that would ignite a pretty excitable group of people, uh, maybe as much as other solutions. So I think that there's a tendency to think that that uh, just changing the monetary unit. Uh, uh, fortunately, people don't say, oh, well, the thing that would really help Greece uh, is if they adopted a meter that was only half as long, because then uh, their textile industry would make more money. Uh, <laughs> but that's, it's a, that's a correct analogy between, you know, uh, the, the, the euro is, is nothing but a unit of purchasing power. It's just like the meter. And yet people talk about it as if it was something terribly different. Um, on the other hand, the reluctance to uh, allow financial institutions to uh, default, I think, is, is driven in large part by uh, the fact that uh, in Europe, as in the US, as we've learned, uh, policymakers are very intertwined with financial institutions in terms of their interests. There's, there's way too much influence in, in Washington and in the European capitals by people who are directly connected to financial institutions. We haven't, we haven't uh, succeeded in preventing uh, that concentration of, of power from transferring from a financial institution to the government. We don't. Higher don't paying jobs there. Higher paying jobs yeah, in the government. Go, yeah. No, when the government move, the people move from the government yes, to the yes, financial that's sector, they get higher paying jobs than if they would go back to farming or things like that. Yeah. So I think we should open, <laughs> open the floor to questions. And just, I just want to make one clarification. I actually don't think that the government should give a free put to, to, to banks. I think shareholders should take the first loss completely. Unsecured debt holders should take the second loss completely. And the government should be there not to ensure the existence of a bank, but the existence of a, of a financial system. So. Would you ask your question? Would you think, though, that you'd have the idea that the only thing we should really ensure is deposits of individuals and that those deposits should be separated from the bank itself. So you have a separate bank and then the bank would then go to the markets, raise its capital in the markets, and then that bank would tend, would fail on its own. Yes, I, well, I think it should be there to ensure that the deposit, I think the big issue which is, which is lies at the core of Dodd-Frank is that the government needs to be able to circumvent the judicial process to uh, seize private property of a, of a financial institution that poses a, 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 a systemic risk. And so going into a Washington Mutual where you wipe out the shareholders, wipe out the unsecured uh, debt holders, and Washington Mutuals functions the next day under other ownership, that's how I think the government should, in, should intervene. I think the challenge of Lehman, with, like Hank Paulson would say, he didn't have the ability to void the bankruptcy process. Uh, and therefore, no one knew exactly what they had uh, the moment Dick Fold pushed the bankruptcy button. But yeah, I, I you know, do not believe that banks' uh, existence should be uh, uh, insured by the U.S. government. So why, did, why then, instead of Dodd-Frank, did we not try to correct the bankruptcy rules? As, and may, if there were frictions in the bankruptcy rule, then why do we need a whole new bankruptcy mechanism and not just adjust what we had or I learn from the mistakes? banks that believe we should do that, and I think there's a person in this room who's been advocating that sort of a like chapter 14 uh, uh, bankruptcy. So I do think that, that, that you could affect it that way without all the complications of that, Frank. Okay. Here comes another. Yeah, she's going to beat you up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could I, just, while, while you're coming up, is just make one remark. The, there's a question of just how much value you can extract from the unsecured uh, debt holders and the, and the 
and there may not be much value there. And that's because we allow such thinly capitalized banks. But now we're not, well, yeah. I'm actually involved with the, the CIFI resolution in the FDIC, and I can tell you it's very complicated because one of the things that's wrong with the, with the bankruptcy court, uh, code for these institutions is exemptions from bankruptcy of repos and derivatives, things like that. So everybody can grab their collateral and start closing, and that created a lot of a lot of fragilities in there. So there's just too much maturity transformation, too much short-term debt. It's related to uh, to equity, but it's partly the the sort of rat race to borrowing that, that there is to shorten and shorten the maturity of, of, of the debt. That makes it very complicated to decide how to maintain an institution like that as a going concern. And the resolution is just a mess. So we just had a article from, the, from Harvey Miller, an op-ed in the New York Times recently, just saying that we can't do resolution that Lehman bankruptcy was, uh, you know, I, I happen to look at it. Lehman disclosed 179 subsidiaries. If you look at Banscope, it had like 443, but in the bankruptcy, there were like 8,000 subsidiaries that had, they had to deal with in 40 different countries. So it's a mess, basically. So that's so, the problem. So, sorry, but what do we do? You're, we, we look to you for solutions. Oh, oh yeah. so solutions, more equity. <laughs> Good. Okay. Uh, I have a question for Bob. So suppose instead of Mario Draghi, we have Bob Hall being the head of the ECB right now. <laughs> and uh, you see the uh, inflation expectations in the Eurozone dropping towards zero, maybe below zero. Uh, what can you do? We talked about the balance sheet of the ECB and the dangers involved with that. Do you see any other way to doing things like what Mario Draghi is doing right now? Or what is your view on this? Uh, well, I don't think you need to take me to the ECB. It's only half the distance to uh, Washington, DC, uh, and put me in the place of Bernanke, because uh, I think it's essentially the same issue. That is, some stimulus from the central bank would be a very useful thing, both in the US and in Europe in the Eurozone, or for that matter, in Britain. Um, and uh, the central problem here is the zero lower bound on, the, on interest rates. Um, first of all, uh, the ECB still has a policy rate that's well above zero. Uh, the US has as a, as a policy currently of paying interest on reserves of 25 basis points, which, as Alan Blinder has been lecturing us, is crazy. Um, so the first thing we could do and the ECB could do would be what the Danish Central Bank has done, which is to set a policy rate of minus 20 basis points. But I wouldn't stop there. I think we can go to, say, minus 3%. Uh, at minus 3%, hedge funds would invest heavily in uh, dollar bills. So there's a couple things we need to do to control that. One is stop issuing new 50 and $100 bills, which would be a good thing to do socially in any case since they're held almost entirely by drug dealers. Um, and then, then we need to have a tax of, of 3% uh, uh, on the holding of currency in order to uh, prevent uh, organized groups from holding it in large amounts. And then finally, we need a, an export, uh, one-time export tax if you export currency. That whole combination would give a tremendous jolt to the economy. Uh, I think in the US, uh, those simple policies, which don't really cost anything, uh, could bring us back to full employment within a year or two. Uh, and same thing in Europe. So there is a policy, a perfectly realistic policy, not an expensive one. It doesn't involve infrastructure investment or any of those crazy things. Just a very straightforward policy based on negative interest rates uh, that would get us out. Um, and uh, you know, I've discussed this with lots of policymakers, and um, they well, there's beginning to be a glimmer of interest. And the, the courageous Danish central bank uh, has, is leading the way. Um, and, but they haven't put, of course, they haven't done any of these currency things, and that's what limits them to minus 20 basis points. Uh, but that's the plan. And uh, I'm going to try to sell it to Obama as soon as you know, he gets through the debates. <laughs> <laughs> tonight, why don't you pile him up tonight? <laughs> Questions. Well, actually, quite just a follow-up. Go ahead. What, 
why is it a case that we shouldn't be an economy in a world that really has a situation where we are in a deflationary deflation for a, a period of time, maybe for a very long time, so that basically uh, that your your system uh, would actually not work? I mean, with the idea of you mentioned earlier today about um, uh, automation and uh, the fact that. Um, we're replacing, um, replacing labor with uh, automation and also the idea that we have outsourcing in the, around the world. So basically it, uh, with having an output gap in that and also at the same time having a combination of, uh, of um, you know, debt, debt uh, having to come down because we had a period of very excessive increases in debt that it's going to take time for this to adjust and basically uh, Deflationary uh, period might be a good for our economy. Essentially, deflationary. What? What's the benefit? What, what's the benefit of inflation? Deflation just period. makes a zero lower bound and deliver a higher real interest rate. So, um, I don't see why. No, you, but I mean, the there's nothing good to be said about deflation. Well, presumably, uh, I think one of our problems right now is we're in a situation we have a debt uh, debt restructuring that's going on in the United States and Europe, obviously, as we talked about, and it's going to take. Uh, time for that to. Yeah, but we can do that and have full employment too. Trust me. I don't think so. <laughs> we won't. Well, I guess it's been a long day. So uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Good.